This is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Everybody sing along with me. Yes, I love I love singing along with that. Hi, everybody. This is Alex Bennett, and this is The Ramble, a little program that we do each and every uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, coming at you live from uh, New York City at 10 o'clock Eastern Time. Accommodate for that wherever you happen to be. If you're out on the left coast of the United States, it would be 7 o'clock. So, hi. How are you? We're ready to go, and we go until midnight Eastern Time, so get ready for the Citizens Panel about a half hour from right now. Get those seatbelts on. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Right now, uh, as we like to do now and then, uh, at least once a week, we check in with one of our favorite, favorite people. Ladies and gentlemen, one of my favorite people to sit down and talk to, and that's why he's on every week with me, because we get to talk about stuff, and it, it's just a chat, right, Larry Bubbles Brown? We reminisce. We reminisce. We, we, we live in the past. We live in the past. We live off our past glories, you know. I often talk about the movie The Roaring Twenties, starring Jimmy Cagney, and I can't remember who the woman was in it. Is it Ann Sheridan? I don't know. It doesn't matter. He's dying on the steps of the... Uh, of, of essentially a, a church, whatever church it was, probably could have been um, uh, here in New York. And he's dying because he's been shot by Humphrey Bogart. And uh, she's cradling him in his, her arms and he dies. And then a cop comes along, and I think maybe the cop was played by Ward Bond, I'm not sure. And he looks down and said, Who was he? And she gives him his name and he says, she says, "What does he? What did he? What did he do?" And she looked back up at him and said, "He used to be a big shot." <laughs> and I always love the last lines, you know, in those Warner Brothers films because they were always memorable. Like, is this the end of Rico? You know, things like that. He used to be a big shot, and that term has always stayed with me because that's the way I describe my career. What do you do? I used to be a big shot. <laughs> Um, but it, 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 I wasn't as humble as I am now because not being a big shot humbles you when you have been a big shot. You can't be humble when you're a big shot. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and somebody said, well, you're a has-been. And I said, yeah, but it's better than being a never was. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, so how, how, how do you feel about politics and we don't talk politics with you that often no i try to avoid them i just i just see so much of this crap on facebook where just people are getting into fights and screaming and uh i think i was traumatized as a child because of well that's obvious yeah it was, <laughs> it was, it was 1960 my uh my parents had voted for jfk and my grandparents were coming out for Thanksgiving, and they were really conservative. And my parents said, "Whatever you do, don't tell don't tell the grandparents that we voted for John F. Kennedy." And I think I must have, as soon as they got there, I, I must have let it fly out. Either that, or my grandmother, who was kind of devious, must have got it out of me. And yeah. this caused a huge, huge fight. And the grandparents, they actually left. They didn't have dinner with us. And my grandmother's at the door pointing at my father and said, you're no longer my son. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. They got, they got in the car and left. My mother picked the turkey out of the oven and threw it in the backyard. Really? Yeah, just heaved it out the back door. And well, we had a, a cat. Uh, a cat. Our cat, Mike, he pounced on the turkey. <laughs> just gnawed on this thing for the entire day. <laughs> He ate so much turkey he couldn't move for two days. That's what I remember. It's, it's, so amazing. Was, it's amazing. It's so amazing. You think, you think politics are bad now because people are shrieking about Trump all the time? But I mean, it was that bad then. So. Well, I mean, uh, 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 this was when 
1960. Talking, 1960. Yeah, in the 60s, you had the Vietnam War and stuff going on, and that brought probably the biggest divisiveness we've ever had in this country. But it was a different kind of divisiveness, or mm -hmm. as the British say, divisiveness. Um, it was a different kind of divisiveness uh, than, that we had back then because it was, it, it was a life-and-death situation. We were sending people off to get killed, Right. For yeah. something that made no sense whatsoever to a large majority of the American public. So that was different than being at odds with each other over a president uh, who was just causing nothing but disdain in the country and, and disruption in the country. He tries to stir the pot constantly and get people mad and arguing with each other and being separated from each other. And that's... There's a difference there. The war in Vietnam, though, divided us in a way like we've never been divided before. I mean, we were. Well, just, Mort Saul said the Vietnam War probably divided the country more than the Civil War. In, again, in a different way, you know. Uh, I mean, the Civil War was. I think it was an economic war more than anything else. I mean, what what Abraham Lincoln was doing by freeing the slaves. It was not so much that he cared about black people as he wanted economic sanctions against the South. And so they couldn't put up. That was a major part of their economy, the fact that they had slaves to do their labor for them. I mean, this country's always loved cheap labor. Yeah, exactly. And um, it was very, very sad, you know. Uh, but that was, that was the reason for that war. In other words, it was a different kind of divisiveness. But we, we literally had a civil war going on here in, in the 60s between uh, those people who were for the war and those who were against it. And those who, who were against it had to commit crimes in order to survive, like go to Canada, refuse the draft, uh, do things like that. Uh, I don't know what I would have done if I had been draftable uh, because I would have had to make some kind of decision. Um, but luckily what I had done is, is I had gone into the military uh, when I became, uh, when it looked like they were going to draft me, you know, because they had a draft even when there wasn't a war on. And so I joined the Navy. Uh, I joined the Navy Reserve where I had to go in for two years and, and serve for two years. And so after I did that, I would, I, they couldn't draft me, okay? Number one, I belonged to the Navy. And uh, uh, I had already done my service. So I didn't have to worry about the draft. But, I mean, I squeaked away on that one. Because when, yeah. I was, when I was being mustered out of the Navy, I was being mustered out with friends who I had been mustered in with. And on the side of their uh, – uh, uh, you had the name of your ship on your, on, your, on your shirt. It was like, you know, up around your shoulder. And it would say the USS Topeka, uh, excuse me, USS Maddox and the USS C. Turner Joy. My friends were on both of those boats, and they were out in the Gulf of Tonkin. And that's when it all began. So I missed that draft by about, you know, two years. So I was very lucky. Yeah. What did yeah, you do? Yeah. You, you. I always thought the, uh, I never, I always thought I hated the idea of a peacetime draft. I just thought... How can the government grab your life for two years? But. Well, they did do it. You know, yeah, it was. It, you know what it was? It was an aftermath of World War II. They just didn't do away with the draft. It's just they didn't need as many people as they used to need, right? Uh, but what about you? How you you went through that period? How did you get? I was I was up for the yeah. I was at the tail end of the Vietnam. I could. I was up for the draft, and I went in for a physical and. Uh, turns out the guy that examined me was a very anti-war doctor and he just kind of signed everybody off so they're not this guy's not uh, capable to serve so I, I beat it completely wow that uh, he would make up things like you had vision problems or something this is back in ohio it was great <laughs> boy i would love to find that guy if he's still alive. yeah I, I don't know if i can find his name or not he's probably not even alive but. because that's that's what i call heroism that's kind of like the people, you know, helped uh, Jews during World War II avoid the Nazis. 
Yeah, yeah. this guy must have been named Schindler. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doctor Schindler. <laughs> so you, so you never had to serve. Never had to serve, but I was sweating out. In 1970, I didn't want to go for sure. And uh, remember, my, my my parents said, "If you get drafted, we uh, will help you go to Canada." Well, you know that that was the I mean, th that war was it? That war was a total debacle. Well, I was I was split on uh, people who went to Canada. Okay, for this reason, that they went to Canada, and so therefore they weren't creating a protest. You know, they were just opting out of both the war and a protest. Uh, and if more people had stayed in this country and just clogged up the court system and made it ridiculous because too many people were going to jail for a short period of time, uh, it would have clogged up the system and maybe that would have helped change it. You know, then you mm -hmm. were still doing your duty. I mean, you always had the right to refuse. You also had the right to go to jail if you refused. That was the other yeah. part of it. You, 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 I remember there was a there were a couple of ways you could get out of it. Number one, bone spurs. That's what happened with Donald Trump. <laughs> he never. Or served. you could say you were gay. <laughs> well, you could say you were gay, uh, but then I think they asked you to blow somebody. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you had to prove it. <laughs> you had to prove it. And, you know, the worst part about that is getting the taste out of your mouth after you're through. Uh, you know, uh, you could say you were gay. They always were suspicious of that, I mm -hmm. think. Um, but uh, you, you, you could, um, uh, I, I, you know, people had certain small ailments they could be kept out. I mean, like bone spurs. Uh, yeah, wasn't it flat feet, something like that, too? Or? Yeah, flat feet. Um, you know, you could have some congenital disease, too, that would keep you out. Uh, but if you were able-bodied, man, you were off the, uh, going off there, and it was like being, I don't know, uh, being executed. Because, I mean, your chances of getting killed over there were pretty goddamn good. You yeah, know? it was uh, so, for nothing. Yeah, it was for nothing. Anyway, you know, it's it's sad. Uh, when we have things like that. that war was just pathetic when you look back on it when you look at what it was when you look at all the human beings that got killed in that war and for what nothing 50 50 thousand americans 50 thousand americans nothing all right um the the best war in history was the gulf war with uh, george bush senior because there we only lost 35 people Mm -hmm. You know that that was the I think the least lethal war we've ever waged, but you know in Vietnam that was it was just there was nothing to win over there, you know, and they kept throwing no, they kept throwing human beings at this thing like they were firewood. And that brought uh, brought down LBJ, who might have had the most success. I think he got more legislation through than anybody, maybe except FDR. Civil, civil, totally, civil, uh, civil rights legislation. That I do know. He got through more civil rights legislation. He got civil rights. He got Medicare. Yep, yep, yep. And he uh, he just uh, he just felt that everybody was against him because of the war. I think it was actually I think it was Walter Cronkite that made him decide not to run again because right. He, 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 he we'll tell the story. You know the story, right? I, I forget what Cronkite said, but he, he Cronkite had actually gone to Vietnam, and what did he say? And he came back, he and he, he was just he was just he suddenly said, you know, this is a feudal war, blah 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 blah, and uh, LBJ supposedly looked over at the person next to him and said, if you've lost Walter Cronkite, you've lost the American people. Yes, and then uh, LBJ announced that. Uh, Without telling anybody, he came on TV one night, gave a speech, and at the end of the speech said he was not going to run again and caught everybody off guard. I, that was the night I became a psychic. I'm watching the, the speech, right? And there are a bunch of people with me. And I look over at them while he's giving the speech, and there's no indication of it. And I said, I bet tonight he announces he's not going to run again. Really? Yeah. And sure enough, end of the end of the speech, he said, and I choose not to, you know, run for my pre for the presidency again and i think he was 
I think he felt a little overwhelmed by the war because the, 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 the positives of, of LBJ were that he was a domestic president because, you know, he's a man of the, of the country. You know, he, he grew up in Texas. Uh, but he wasn't worldly. He, he, like Kennedy, was worldly. He was, he was mm -hmm. a president of the world and uh, had a good grasp of international politics. I think uh, he, uh, Lyndon Johnson felt that was his weak spot. And now that Vietnam was happening, this was something he didn't know how to handle. And so he just decided to opt out, which I thought was very honorable. You call it, though, he said. Yeah, I called it. March, 30, March 31st, 1968. Jesus, how do you remember these things, or did you just I look? remember, I was watching, it was a Sunday night. This is how, uh, this is such a wild year as 1968 was, and it's March 31st, and uh, uh, four days later, Martin Luther King got assassinated. How do you remember these things? What what is it in you? I can't figure. This is this is the we we often referred to bubbles as Rain Man, <laughs> highly functioning savant, <laughs> a highly functioning savant. No, I mean the fact that you remember dates is just just overwhelms me. Well, I remember certainly remember that day because I just remember everybody was. It's not like I'm asking him some stupid question like what day did we hold the New Year's Eve show on? Uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, I'll, I'll mention something that happened to me in, in San Francisco, and you can give me the date. Uh, generally, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're 68 very... was a wild year, so there's a lot of things to remember. Don't worry, you're going to lose this ability as you get older. I just, I'm finding now that I, I really think I'm going, I'm losing. I think I'm, it's not Alzheimer's because, you know, it's, it, but, I, but it's something else. Because I'm, I'm suddenly like yesterday, I was doing things like leaving the fire on on the stove. I was, you know, there were a whole bunch of things and I'm going, I'm losing it. And I got very wow. depressed over it. You know, I mean, I'm holding a decent conversation right now. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe it was that I was off for a week and a half and all the things that you normally do, if you don't do them for a week, you forget how to do them. Did yeah. you ever notice that? Yeah, that's and why so, you got to keep at it. So these things I constantly function, and I try to uh, keep trying to figure out, well, where did I go for that, and where did I go for this? And you, and with computers especially, there's so much to remember. You know, there's something like uh, you, you you fix something a year ago, but now you can't remember how you fixed it. You know, and so you got to rediscover fixing it. And, and the, the, things like that happen. So anyway, I'm losing it, folks. So, you know, one day I'm just going to come on the air and I'm just going to drool and that's going to be the show. <laughs> drool and babble. <laughs> that's going to be the show, you know. And, <laughs> and, and uh, I love my wife dearly, but, you know, I wake up every morning and if she's there, I'm looking at an old lady. <laughs> You know, I, you know. <laughs> I gotta get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking to myself, you know, I, I, you know, if I woke up with a woman that age, Thirty years ago, I would wonder how drunk I got the night before, you know. <laughs> and, and she happens to be a very attractive woman, by the way, for her age. But, and not even for her age, she happens to be a very attractive woman. But nevertheless, you know, I go, uh, uh, Jim, I'm married to an old lady, yes, and she's married to an even older guy, you know. And then I have this friend uh, who's seventy. 87 years old and now I'm only I'm I'm nine years younger than that okay but I look at him and I go is that the future you know I mean I love him and he's he has a great memory of recall for stories and things like that and it's just he's enriched my life but I still go is that what happens to you when you're 87 and then I look at guys like Mel Brooks and I go, well, he doesn't look that bad. But then again, you're not in a room with him when he's not on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because I remember I remember once watching the Letterman show and it seemed that Bob Hope was doing live at five at another in another studio. And uh, they he asked them to bring Bob Hope over when when he was through there. And so uh uh, Letterman goes, oh, look who's here, Bob Hope. And they take a shot of the door, I think, before he says that. And here you see this old, doddering guy hunched over 
walking through the doors of the studio at NBC. And then Letterman says, Bob Hope, and he stands straight up. And all of a sudden, he's got the swagger, and he's Bob Hope. <laughs> you know, it's almost mm-hmm. like, you know, they had, a, they had a piece of luggage, and they packed up Bob Hope. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, oh, oh, wait a minute, I, I can let you hear something. This is something, you know, let me see if I can find it here. I have it on the other machine, so it, it will work just fine. Here we go. Where's Bob Hope? Bob Hope, Bob Hope. There we go. Uh, this was a promo. I, you probably remember me playing this. this. One of our guys was down someplace where Bob Hope was, and he wanted him to do a promo. Now, Bob at this time, I think, was like 98. <laughs> I don't know how ever old he was. He was really, really old. And this is what transpired, and we actually made a promo by chopping it up. But this is the raw tape. Listen to this. He wants you to do a station promo. What is it? This is Bob Modern Rock Hope. This you're is, listening to Alex Bennett. This is Bob Modern Rock Hope. And you're listening to... <laughs> Alex Bennett on Live Alex 105. Bennett on Live... 105. 105. One up from the top? Yeah, one more. This is now, Bob Modern Rock Hope. You're listening to Alex Bennett, Live 105. Alex Bennett. Alex Bennett, you're listening to Alex Bennett on Live 105. There we go. Wow. See what I'm talking that's about? A, that sounded like Curtis D. Martini. <laughs> it could have been. Could have been. Yeah. Uh, that 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 is my favorite piece of tape that I own. <laughs> I mean, just completely oblivious. Um, but you know, is that what is that what I have to look forward to now? Is that I the know, deep, uh, the deep abyss of not knowing where you are? Is that, you know, and <laughs> it's just totally out of it. <laughs> and and I asked I asked my my friend, you know, uh, what are the problems of being 80, 87? And he said the doctors keep fooling around with you. Yeah. You know, they keep poking here and poking there and doing a little operation here and a little operation there, and you know. And I, I wonder, you know, I mean, I'm, I have this horrible fear of death, as I think you do as well, right? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. um, the idea of not existing doesn't make sense to me. Um, no. And, and um, uh, I don't know if it won't get to be a point where I won't say, just let me die. You know, because you just don't want to have to put up with all that poking and prodding and operating and doing stuff like that. I mean, if I'm 87 years old and they say you've got cancer, I'd probably have to say, well, then just let it eat me up. Let it go. You yeah. know, what, what, what are we going to operate for? So I can get another three years and die of a heart attack? You know, I mean, and also when you get older, they, they go, oh, well, we don't have to give you this test or that test anymore because your life expectancy isn't that long. I know. <laughs> and you go, oh, okay. Oh, that's wonderful, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are a few things, benefits to getting older. SAG doesn't charge me a, uh, 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 a fee every year now to be a member of SAG because I am a senior member and I get it for free. Oh really? Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I uh, that that's okay. Uh, no, nope, still nobody gets up at, in a in a crowded subway car to say, "Here, old man, here's a seat for you." So maybe I'm looking younger than I am. I don't know. I have no idea. But there, I, I don't very, know. If you're very spry. And as I have been <laughs> saying lately, and I'm I'm in fact going to write a little article on it that when I was a kid I always wanted to be a superhero and have any one of a number of powers but the power that I wanted most was the power of invisibility you know because you could see naked women and do things like that you know the power of invisibility and I find now that I am 78 years old I have gained that power I'm invisible (laughs) I'm invisible to everyone okay (laughs) Women no longer turn their heads when I walk down the street, you know, or if I look at them, they give me a dirty look. <laughs> yeah. 
So. Yeah, I think you reach an uh, you reach an, guys reach an age where the women don't reject you; they just don't even see you. Yeah, well, no, you you are invisible to at least a larger part of the population. Mm -hmm. You just you can walk down the street, you can bump into walls. Nobody's paying attention to you. You know, uh, it, it's 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 kind of it's pathetic. That's what you have to look forward to, for folks. I'm the Sacagawea <laughs> of aging, right? With my hand, my hand up to my forehead, looking at the world in front of me and telling you, "Go back, go back." <laughs> How many people got the Sacagawea reference? Oh, wasn't she? <laughs> wasn't she a coin? You know, she was a coin. Yes. Yes. Sacagawea led the Lewis and Clark Exposition. Hey, once again, gee, I hate this because I love talking to you. I really do. It's it. Yes, what what little time we have left has flown by. <laughs> what little time we have left is flown. Another hour of my life sucked up doing nothing. <laughs> now I've, I, you know, I'm still in my pajamas with my slippers on, and it'll probably be that way through the show tonight. So you know. Whatever, Larry. Thank you so much. I always yes, appreciate. Yeah, so I just wanted to say, hey, let's hope this is a great new year for both of us. And, and thanks uh, for being here for me for the last year. Oh yeah, we'll forge ahead. The lovely and attractive and always abundant. I don't know what that means, Larry Bubbles <laughs> Brown. This is Gabnet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Talk like you've never heard it before. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, there we go. Just cleaning my glasses, doing a few little things like that. Uh, I uh, uh, and uh, I guess I I will uh, let me go open my Skype lines here. There's a little hiss on that uh, interview because I forgot to redo it in mono, and the stereo for some reason generates a hiss. Isn't that wonderful? This is one of the little little problems that I have here. At Gabnet. Well, let me let me see here. Let me open up the uh, Skype lines so that people can call because we do a thing called the Citizen Panels, and that is uh, us and uh, not just one, not just two, not just three, but I got boards uh, maybe like uh, ten of us talking together, and uh, it's a lot of fun. You'll you'll see what I mean uh, if anybody calls me. That's the that's the biggest problem. Uh, let me see here. I put the glasses on. Actually, you know, ever since I uh, got this bigger screen, and ever since I got uh, the uh, the cat or the cataracts taken care of, my eyesight is pretty pretty damn good for reading at this distance. So you know, I have I have old old, old man syndrome in which we have taken this thing, and uh, and put it. Uh, let me just do something here. I gotta I gotta fix things up here so that the picture's right. And I go over and we take a look. And there he is. Look at that. Hey. That's our regular, ladies and gentlemen. The regular yeah. is clockwork. Yeah, well, at least at least something's regular in my at life. At least something's regular, uh, yeah. Uh, hey, you know, if you, if you get Alzheimer's and you can't remember uh, uh, Marjorie, you just figure it this way. You're waking up with somebody new every day. Yeah, you know, well, they, I keep keep saying about the, the great thing about having Alzheimer's is that you, uh, it's all the new people you keep meeting. You yeah. Know? You're just making new friends every single day. Exactly. Okay. By the way, um, hello, Mike. How are you? Are you there, Mike? Mike always has yep, trouble. Here. Oh, oh, okay. Usually, Mike has trouble on his first pass at trying to get in. Uh, Man, I say, huh? Phil, 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 did you have a lot of rain your way? Yes. Uh, yes, we've had a lot of rain. Okay. Uh, if, well, that's believe it, that's exciting. Believe it or not, believe it or not, we had over the last thirty-six hours over green certain areas, green three to four inches of rain. Uh, get That's a lot of rain. Boy, is this, get, is this interesting? Get ready for the locusts and the plague. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've already had the plague. He's called Trump. But anyway, we'll get to that in a little bit. No, so I, <laughs> you know, you were talking about new people you meet. I, I met a new person last night, somebody 
there's a thing called the Rialto Report, which if I could suggest something, it's really a good site to go to. Yeah. It's all about porn in the 70s and the porn business and the people who are in their late 60s, early 70s, into kind of the mid-80s. I've got something to say on that, uh, not the Rialto well, Report. Well, can, go I, ahead. can I finish uh, saying this? Yeah, I give you permission. I so I got a call from them, oh, I don't know, geez, had to be six months ago, saying we're, we want to do a podcast on mid, about Midnight Blue. And uh, oh, you know, do it on it, it, want, no wanted to give us no. It's on. They have their own site, Phil. They have their own yeah, podcast. Yeah, so uh, people at midnight or or one in the morning or whatever they get on. No, 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 no but no. They, that's a live show that goes out to radio stations, and they're simply broadcasting it here. I don't know what you're getting at. Anyway, these yeah, guys show, ha that's they have a podcast. No, this they wouldn't do a show because what they do is if you go over there to the Rialto Report. You'll see they really craft each and every episode that they do. I mean, it's highly produced. Uh -huh. And and so the guy and his wife invited me out to dinner last night it was with Marjorie. Yeah. And we met these two really, really great people. We, we hope we've made new friends with these people. And, and it's not like they're in it's not like they're into porn. They're like anthropologists of a sort doing this thing of trying to collect all the stories and, and interviews with all the people that were involved with that period of time in porn. Did you tell them about the pictures you were in yes, charge yes. of? Yes, in fact, they're, they're, they may work with me at trying to get a book done on them. Uh, Very nice. These guys were also the, I don't know if you saw the Deuce on HBO, but they were consultants to the Deuce. Uh, and uh, he's, he's a, uh, a stockbroker, and she's uh, vice president of a digital company. But their hobby for the last 15 years has been doing this thing called the Rialto Report. So last night they said, well, we're doing the thing on Midnight Blue. And I didn't realize it was up already. And I went home and there it was. And I went and listened to it. And I got to tell you, if you go listen to it, I, I, it's one of the few times anybody's, number one, it's superbly done. It's just Great. So it's Rialto, like the Rialto Bridge? In like the Rialto Theater. It's named after the Rialto Theater here in New York. The longest running kind of porn uh, venue uh, in, in the business. Anyway, um, let me see here. I want to make sure everything's okay. Um, so um, they, they did this thing, and I, and I, and I watched it, and I uh, listened to it, rather. And... You know, normally I, I would go, oh, well, they got that wrong and they got that wrong and they got that wrong. And these people hardly ever interviewed me. They asked if they could use my episodes that I had of uh, Life in the Passing Lane where I do three episodes of Midnight Blue and if they could use my audio from that. And so they take quotes from me out of that. So I'm kind of telling the story while they're telling the story. And um, the first hour of it, it's an hour and a half is about me and Midnight Blue. After that, I left, and they did the last half hour is about what went on after that. And uh, I got to tell you, it, 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 they, did, they got nothing wrong. They knew more about my life than I remember. Okay? That's easy. I'm, no, but no, I mean, really, I'm serious. As I sat there at dinner with, uh, with uh, April and, and uh, Leslie, uh, they... Uh, they were telling me things that they knew that I had completely forgotten. And uh, it is so well done, and it is so truthful to the story of Midnight Blue that it's, it's probably the best I could ever hope for anybody doing it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the video is just, uh, the audio, rather, is just superbly done, and I suggest anybody that gets a chance go over to the Rialto Report and listen to it. Yeah, I didn't live in New York City when you were doing Midnight Blue. The only uh, uh, only uh, thing I know about it is what you showed me. You know, you had some videotapes. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they said to me, they asked me a question. I've been asked this question before. Of all the things you've done in your life, and you've done a lot, they said you were a big success out in California. They knew all about my career and where I'd gone and serious and blah, 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 blah. What is the moment, the, the, the thing you're most proud of? 
And I said, well, most people would say I'd probably say San Francisco, but that was where I was the most successful, okay? And you might think it might be my first period in radio here in New York City because I was doing something unusual in talking to the counterculture in, in New York City and, and having people on like Abby Hoffman and people like giving a voice to something that didn't have a voice usually on AM and then FM radio. Uh, and I said, no, my proudest achievement is Midnight Blue. And I think it is. And if you listen to this, you'll see why, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah, Rialto Report. Rialto Report. R I A L T O. It's a podcast. It's a it's a podcast. It's there. The, the the thing you will see first is the current episode, which is Midnight Blue. Okay, oh, and then it's the whole story. And they, if you're interested in that whole period of time, they have interviews with people like uh, oh, Mal Warb, who calls this yeah. program Carter Stevens, the late Jamie Gillis. Uh, uh, on and on and on. I mean, they, they've literally, um, over a period of 14 years, have tried to catalog that period of time and memorialize it. And and they're not porn fans. I mean, I, I, uh, in fact, when they were out in California, they told a story where Paul Fishbein, who runs AVN, Adult Video News, uh, said, well, have you ever been on the set? Of, I assume you've been on the set of a porn film. And they said, no, we've never been on the set of a porn film. He said, well, then let me take you. And he was surprised that, you know, they weren't, they weren't porn fans. They were fans of that period of time and that culture and what was going on in New York City. And yeah. um, uh, he, he said on a couple of occasions, they've actually had people they were interviewing, and afterwards they go, so you, are you swingers? You know, and they go, no, sorry. <laughs> you know, and they just backed off and went away. How come you're so blurry, uh, Mike? Your camera's blurry. You have, it's, it's out of it's, it's the rain. No, it's out of focus, or either that you don't clean the lens or something, you know. It's a cigarette residue. It's right? cigarette residue, yeah. It's probably coated this thick with nicotine. So, anyway. So, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, finish. Yeah, so uh, I really, you know, it, it, it is as truthful a documentation of what I did back then as anybody could possibly do you know and usually I'm unhappy with stuff like it because they get stuff wrong you know and they they don't they don't get it exactly right so did you ask them why uh, they were attracted to that genre in that period of time he said to me that he was working in London in in this in the in brokerage and they assigned him to New York City. And he was thrilled with the idea of going to New York City because he wanted to see this town where, you know, it had this certain danger to it, whatever, a whole bunch of things. He's, he got here, and it was sterile by then. You know, Giuliani had cleaned up Times Square, and, I mean, everything was just... And he said he longed to see what those days were about. And so they started, he, he and his wife started looking into that period of time and found that this genre of art, as he, they referred to it, was, um, uh, was a story in and of itself. So they decided to be the archaeologists of it. Yes. You know, just, yeah. just to, Mike wants to say something, but let me just interject one thing, Mike. Uh, you know, in those earlier years, the 70s and, and, and uh, early 70s, London was so, uh, you know, the advertisements had topless women in the, in the tube. Uh, it, it was, they were much, uh, further, I don't know if you say they're ahead. But I don't they, think I ever saw had, top, I, I, I never saw topless women in advertising. At that I time. Did. did you really? In 72, I was there hmm. and, uh, I rode the tube. Well, I mean, and, they've, they've never had inhibitions about that. I mean, television, they've never worried about language. They've never worried about nudity if it's needed, if it's, if, if it's important to the storyline. Um, so, you yeah, know, I'm not saying it was hardcore, but it was, it was tasteful, but it was, you know, a, a woman with no top and it was on a poster in, in the subway, yeah. uh, the tube. Yeah. And there was other things like that. It seemed that they were less inhibited than, uh, than American advertising. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, well that, we've always, we've always been, we're very puritanical here. I mean, to think that on television, we still go crazy when somebody says a four letter word. I mean, come on, be an adult, grow up. So the FCC can collect a fine. 
You know, the FCC wasn't in the business of collecting fines. Apparently they are now. I don't know what they do with the money. Uh, uh, and I, I had a boss by the name of Mel Carmazan, who in fact, in the Howard Stern situation, refused to pay it. You know, he just said, fuck you, I'm going to fight this. Because most of the time, radio stations never fought that, mm -hmm. you know. And they would uh, they would just, oh, okay, how much money do we owe? Uh, What's the size of the Howard Stern uh, fine? Uh, I can't remember now. It was it was fairly large, but that wasn't the point with Mel Carmazan. It was that he didn't think he should be fined at all. That you know that that you know this is silly. And he actually, in the end, I think he won, if I'm not mistaken, or they gave up. You know, Mike wanted to say something, and I sort of jumped. Alex, I was going to ask you. Back in 1960s, you know, between 1960 and 69. Wasn't the porn industry in San Francisco was kind of big then? 69? Yeah, pre-69. Yeah, but I, 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 I had nothing to do with that porn scene at all. Yeah. Uh -oh. But it was big in San Francisco. Though. Well, no, it was built, the Mitchell brothers, Jim and Artie. You know. Were they around in the sixty in the early sixties? They were. They were around. They they started. Uh, God, I don't know when. Big Al. Behind the green door. I put uh, the carpet. Big Al's. Yeah, I I don't know when they when the. Really. <laughs> can I finish what I'm trying to muse about here? I can't remember when Behind the Green Door came out, but the Mitchell brothers were doing it on the West Coast. But West Coast porn was almost unheard of at that point. Uh, and uh, New York was the porn center of America. Mm. Yeah. So you would you would think though you know California mm -hmm. seventy two behind the green door. Uh, behind the green door seventy two. Okay. Yeah. So seventy two was when they came out with when was Deep Throat? Look up Deep Throat. <laughs> Look up Deep Throat. Deep Throat was probably about a year earlier. <clears throat> Here's Jeff Stein. Hi, Jeff. Oh, there's a light, mm -hmm. in back, light in back of you, but no light on your face. Oh, sorry. 72, <laughs> deep throat. Not 70. much light today. Let's see if I turn this one. Yeah, there, that's good. There that's good. Yeah. Deep throat, yeah. 72. Yeah, awesome. deep throat was 72. Yeah, so they they both came out about that year. But New York, pretty much, you know, it was very funny. Uh, they busted, uh, uh, they busted uh, deep throat here in New York. And they also busted it upstate in, I'm trying to remember what town it was, but some small town upstate New York. They convicted them in New York City and then stayed up in upstate New York. They, yeah. they found them not guilty. Really? <laughs> yes. You would think it would be the other way around. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you would think, yeah. Small been... town, you know, small town, yeah. Yeah. Judges, yeah. okay, you're guilty. You're That's the go point I was making, Mike. That was the point I was making. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, you're still in Florida, there, Jeff. Yeah. I am still in Florida, and smart man. <laughs> one more day. Actually, it's it's actually warm there now. Really? Yeah, what is yeah. it? I didn't even go out today. Really? Yeah. So anyway, so so anyway, the Rialto report, and uh, it it wow, there's nobody watching the video. What's the problem? You don't like us, or is it just that the, the people who are on right now are too ugly? Uh, you know, get us a woman with big jugs starting to call this show, and you bet your life we'd start having viewers. Uh, anyway. Uh, I thought about that the other day. Uh, but anyway, go, go, oh, and then another part of my history, there's this uh, guy named Joey Skaggs, who uh, I did a thing with Midnight Blue called The Cat House for Dogs. Uh, and um, what is all that noise? Is that you going back and forth there? Uh, could be. Yeah, could Can be. I yeah, anyway, um, um, and Joey Skaggs is a prankster, and he did a, a he did a thing called the Cat House for Dogs, and called up me and said, "Would you like to videotape it? Where we opened up a cat house for dogs, where you can come and get your dog laid. You know, city dogs need to get laid too." And I, I went, okay, sure. I mean, that sounds it sounds interesting. It was the kind of thing, you know, we do, right? So do you, go down. Do you have this on your Facebook uh, live? Yes. I don't see it. Well, I uh, I can see it on two different browsers here. 
Uh, let me refresh. Yeah, do something like that because I'm 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 getting it here just fine. Uh, I always do that for reference, you know. Uh, and uh, anyway, where was I? So, cat house for dogs. Uh, cat dogs. House, the cat house for dogs. So um, uh, I go over there and I immediately realize this whole thing's a put on. But I don't tell my crew, and I let myself believe it so that when we shoot it, we shoot it from a perspective of not trying to kind of play with it, but just really follow it and report it and so on. And Joey even thought, I think the biggest, the biggest uh, art of the, of, of the prank was, was me because I was snookering him into thinking I didn't believe, I, I thought this was for real. That I didn't. I, I. 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 Rather that I believed it was real, and we shot the whole thing, and it was very convincing. Very convincing, as as we as I say, if you believe something, uh, so I didn't let my crew know that I, what I suspected. We shot what was a great documentary on this horrible thing called the Cat House for Dogs and whatever. And uh, after it was over, uh, Joey said, well, thank you very much. I, I hope you enjoyed your time here. And I said, you know, I realize it's a fake. And he went, really? I said, yeah. I said, but I wasn't going to say so because I didn't want, it would have changed the way you reacted to my interview, you know? So, I, uh, so then we went back, edited the thing, put it on Midnight Blue. Next thing you know, Channel 7 is calling me saying, do you have footage of the cat house for dogs? And I said, yeah, we do. And they said, well, we asked Joey Skaggs if we could come out and, you know, videotape his uh, business. And he said, no, but that you had footage. And I said, yeah, we got footage. So we sent him over the segment. And they went on the air and they showed this thing. They did this piece on it and how horrible it was and and doctor uh, veterinarians uh, uh, talking about it and how horrible this whole thing was and it, they they did this whole, just absolute uh uh put put down of us uh, uh, of the cat house for dogs and did they pay for the footage no i didn't charge him for the footage i knew exactly what joey wanted he wanted the publicity and i was happy to have him get it all right happy to see my stuff on tv um, comes a couple of days later and we inform them that it was a fake and they never told their audience. They never went on there. And on top of that, they won an Emmy for the piece. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they, they made this movie. You what too. They, they made this movie about Joey Skaggs called The Art of the Prank because he went on to do more. I think The Cat House for Dogs was the most successful a hoax he ever created. Uh, and I think no small part to what we did in shooting it and making it believable. And uh, they come out with this movie, and I'm all over this fucking movie with the cat house for dogs, me interviewing Joey and them, even a clip of, of, uh, in, uh, out of a newspaper saying Alex Bennett fired from WPLJ probably because of the cat house for dogs, which wasn't <laughs> the reason I got fired there it was several years later I, I i i don't remember the two coordinating with each other but anyway uh <laughs> uh uh and i'm all over the goddamn thing and uh, they never called me they never asked permission to use my image nothing like that and i was complaining because i had read all the the particulars of the picture like i looked them up in imdb and nowhere am i given any kind of credit Right. Yeah. Well, it turns out I watched the movie, and yes, they did credit me, and nice. did credit Midnight Blue with the archival footage. But at no point did they ever get a hold of me and say, you know. And there's one thing I don't like about it, and that's because at one point they have Joey saying about, well, we really snockered the press, and then they show my picture, and yeah. I they he didn't snocker me, you know, he didn't he didn't fool me. You know, I was complicit in this whole goddamn thing. You weren't press. Uh, well, I technically, you could say I was. You know, I was covering a, 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 the press is whoever covers something, you know. Yeah. Oh, uh, you weren't just shooting it to shoot it. Now, I'm going to show uh, the audience something, and you'll see it too. 
I, I, I want to uh, bring this up because I, I, I've been cleaning my apartment. I've been cleaning my studio and everything. If you notice, uh, well, you can't notice here, but it's a little neater back here. And yeah, I, what's the two-foot pile of dust in the corner? Yeah, yeah and then I, 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 uh, I did the whole closet, emptied out the whole closet, took bags of wires that were snarled together and separated all the wires into a new snarl. Uh, and I threw away a lot of them, threw away a lot of stuff. Two, two giant empty boxes I had for my Mac display and my Mac computer. Uh, one thing after another, I completely, um, uh, you know, uh, took care of it. And uh, uh, I cleaned up like crazy. And that's because also in the, uh, in the office, I, I put in a new sound bar. And I uh, got a big new desk for me, so I can kind of have an office in there too. Uh, so I'm building kind of a backup studio in there. Uh, and two. huh? Studio two. Studio uh, two, yeah. And um, you know, I so I'm I'm like fine, you know, emptying out bags of shit and throwing them away and separating things and this thing and that thing. And occasionally I find little things I never thought I still had. Uh, see this? I want to show the audience. Oh, 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 uh, what that appears to be is just a little ball, right? Yeah. But that little ball at a, toy at, a f at a at a uh, uh, computer show that we were showing at in 1998, 99. Okay. We're giving these things away, right? These little balls. They were giving them away, and there were lines literally around the floor of the showroom, of the uh, you know the room where all the people were lining up to get these things before they went before they went uh, uh, before before there were no more, and uh, then they got some more. The next day there was another line, and people got these. Now, you know why they got these? Uh, you remember you remember the Super Balls? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, these are kind of, this is a Super Ball. However, let me see. I have to do it a little uh, harder. Careful. Look, the look, plastic might be so brittle. Look at that right when now. you bounce it. Wow. Now, think about this for a moment. This has been working since 1999, and it still works. Look at that. So it's like those lights that you shake instead of use batteries? No, there's a little a little light in there, and when you hit it on the ground or hit it on something, it starts lighting up. Uh, People were, like, lining up, as I say, around the block. Look at that. I didn't think it, I, I, I saw it, and I went, oh, well, that thing's not going to work. And I dropped it, and all of a sudden it started lighting up. 1999, folks. That's almost 18 years ago, and this thing still works. 15.95 on sale at the Gabnet store. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> so I, I just thought I'd show you what I had found. Very proud of that, you know. Uh, what? 99. Huh? Regular tax. price, 15.99. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, don't forget the tax. So. No, don't forget the tax. No tax uh, out yeah. of state. Uh, so anyway, so the, uh, you know, I've had uh, 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 I did a lot of work here. In fact, I have a little hernia, and it really went bad on me yesterday because I was lifting all these boxes and putting, and then I took these boxes that Damien's been sending, and I had room for those in the closet now instead of in the guest room piled up against the wall. So uh, I did a lot of work, I, and I uh, I wish you could see the rest of this because it's. Uh, uh, it, I cleared out a lot of stuff here, and it's uh, it's much emptier. So, I wonder why I can see your Facebook uh, thing on my phone, but I can't see it on the iPad. Well, I have no idea what your problem is. Well, okay, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna reboot the iPad. Yeah, uh, something because I'm sure it works on the iPad too. You know, uh, I mean. That's doesn't I, I'm just saying that the anomaly here well, wait a minute, is hold on. let me go I, get my let me go get my iPad and I'll see for sure well, I'm sure it probably works there's, there's with some the iPad going, version but, of it but um, what do you what do you uh, what do you use as your uh, as your browser on the uh, um, 
uh, Safari. Oh, really? Oh, we'll try using Chrome. You know, it might, uh, uh, oh, you know, may have a problem with Safari. I have no idea, but wait a minute. Let me, on the phone and let me I'm, open this up here. Jeez, you know. Well, let, let's just talk about technical problems all night, okay? Um, because uh, if I open up my Chrome, uh, wait a minute, let me go to, let me get my Chrome browser because I have GabNet already loaded in there. There it is. Oh, no, I, we have to go to Facebook, don't we? Oh, let me go to my Facebook app. That will make my life uh, a whole lot easier. Um, Facebook. What? Maybe I'll go to the Facebook app. Mm, the Facebook it's app. Like yeah. Chrome. Facebook app. Okay. And it brings it up. There is Facebook. And uh, let me see here. Let me uh go to my page and th there it is see this phil it's working it's working yeah. fine i i've been having more apple problems in the last day or so than i know what to do i, I spent an hour and a half with them on the uh on the phone today they must love you uh yeah. it, it go, you should also go um uh to um where you should go is to um, Gabnet. Uh, no, oh, no, you, I rebooted and I got gotcha. you. You got me. Okay, so you see, there we are. Uh huh. I can just watch the show from here. Anyway, at, where, are we going to get more callers tonight? Where is everybody? Is there some kind of thing going on? I know that uh, Damien didn't do a show tonight because Damien. Wait. Damien, hold on. Let me get rid of. Well, here I'll put it down here. That's what I'll do. Um, Damien uh, wanted to go out on a date with his uh, with his with his wife girlfriend. I, I never can quite figure out what they what the relationship is, but uh, so they they didn't do a show tonight. So, but I don't think everybody did the same thing. So where's my where are the callers tonight? Yeah, well, they they might be snowbound. You know, is is there electricity in New York now? Oh yeah. Yeah, it, it just what is that noise? It's just, Probably me moving around a little bit. It, it, it sounded like it looked like it was Mike blowing his nose. Oh, could be I that. can tell he's off camera. Well, that's why he probably went off camera to blow his nose. So uh, what I was going to say about the porn thing when you were saying is that coincidentally, in the last three months, uh, it's either three or four uh, porn actresses, uh, only one as old as 30, they, the rest were all in their early 20s, uh, have been killed. Uh, so they're, they're saying that there may be somebody or uh, going around, uh, one porn actress, she was 20 years old, very, very pretty, uh, and she said, um, uh, they had said that she was lonely one night and she didn't have, and she just wanted some company. And she twittered something to uh, to her fan base, and uh, the next day she's dead. And uh, I don't know. If what was any, her name? Uh, I'd have to find the article again. It was like uh, Olivia or something, something like that. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and so yeah, they, uh, some sort of thing going on. Get out of this. Probably if I went to ABN, they would probably yeah. have it, you know. Um, but it's uh, it's it's interesting. I'm I'm surprised that hasn't happened more often, you know, because that's a, a business that probably invites stalkers. Yeah, uh, uh, Olivia Nova, twenty years old, is the latest in a string of deaths to the uh, that. Rock the uh, adult industry. Olivia uh, Nova, N O V A. Uh -huh. 20 years old. And uh, she sort of just started, I think, about four months or so before. That wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't be enough to get, that wouldn't be enough to get a, a stalker. Yeah, here's another one, another article. It says another point actress dies way too young, fourth in three months. And that's a San Francisco gate. Uh, and what's her name? Uh, no, well, no. San Francisco Gate is the uh, paper. No, well, no, what's her, what's her name? The one, the um, fourth one. 
Uh, uh, oh, I'm looking. Mm-hmm. Do, 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 do. As Phil looks and reads and reads and looks and reads. Uh, August Ames, she was killed in December. Uh huh. I know of her. Okay, and where's the rest of them? Uh, uh, Amanda Friedman. And, uh, of the Friedmans from the Bronx? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Benny Blanco from the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I can't. Do they think it. they're all linked? Uh, well, um, I don't think so. Uh, but it, it's just a coincidence that they're having this rash of actresses, young actresses. Well, I guess they were all young, uh, being uh, being murdered. Yeah. And uh, wow. you know. When you look at these articles, there's like 600 ads that you have to go through and then push next. And yeah. I hate uh, what the web has become. Actually, the the advertising on the web has become so pervasive that it's more annoying than any other form of, of that that you get in your life. I mean, even spam phone calls aren't as bad as pop-ups, as pop-ups, you know. Yeah, no, this is, and it just, it doesn't stop. And, you know, he, and everybody says that uh, advertising on the web doesn't really give you much of a return, no matter how yeah. cheap it is. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, um, I, I don't think I can find the fourth name. Uh, she was represented by a model agency called Direct Models. Yeah, Direct Models, I think the biggest uh, porn model agency in the business. Oh, and there's a uh, uh, Eurasian uh, Beltran, better known as a street. Uh, her screen name was Yuri Love, so that must have been the fourth. Yuri Love, yeah, Y U R I L U V. Yeah. Oh, boy, well, anyway, it's you know, you know, because we have had porn stars get killed uh, by like boyfriends and you know things like yeah. that. Um, but it, not not as many as you would think. I mean, I I think they're uh, the porn industry has been blessed by the fact that they've they've actually had a lower incidence of AIDS than any other group because they are so careful about it and so aware of it that they you know they do what it takes to prevent it. Yeah. Uh, where you know just the average person out there doesn't think twice about oh I'm not going to get AIDS you know or whatever so. Wasn't there a famous uh, porn star, male porn star, what was named Holmes or something? John that, Holmes, that, he, died, he died of AIDS. Yeah. 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 But, uh, um, but he was also part of a, uh, I don't know, what was the movie? Bo uh, Boogie Nights. Yeah. About, uh, in that thing, the guy gets involved in a murder. In, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that's supposed to be John Holmes because that's exactly what happened to John Holmes. Yeah. Uh, he he was there the night that these guys murdered somebody, and uh, he eventually ratted on them. Yeah. You met my friend, uh, he passed away many years ago, Duke Skinner. Uh, the movie Hardcore with George C. Scott, uh, they filmed part of it in his massage parlor on Broadway, Tiffany's Massage. Yeah, so? Well, it's, uh, you, you uh, know. Uh, oh. that, uh, what does that have to do with John Holmes abetting a murder? Well, a movie, a porn, you know, yeah. porn movie. Out of, you know, out of yeah. Well, here we are talking about porn, and we're not even getting listeners. So, you know, what the hell? Who cares? Who gives a shit? Why do I do this? I have no idea. Yeah. But wasn't there a lot of overdose off from the porn business? No. No? No, not, not any more than in the normal population. You know, I mean, yes, every time a porn actress would overdose and die, you'd hear about it. But right. every time... Uh, somebody in your neighborhood overdosed and died. You didn't, you know. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, and then they would make oh, well, the porn industry is uh, oh, all these deaths from drugs. See how terrible it. Is. Well, yeah, how many people die from drugs who are in the stock market, you know, or yeah. stockbrokers, and how many True. die of drugs who are housewives who are just bored, you yeah. know? I mean, you know, so uh, so I would say I would say that. Uh, uh, you know, I was talking to this, these people last night. I said the trouble with porn today is when I was involved with Midnight Blue, and we were and we were reporting it. We were we were flies on the wall watching what was happening and covering it. 
I said, what I noticed most is the people who were doing it were having a great time doing it. They were having fun. I said, but there's no fun anymore. It's all a business. They said, yeah, we went and saw this porn film being made, and it was exactly that. It was all just very professional. But, you know, nobody looked like they were really enjoying having the sex. Where in the old days, when Mal made a film, he just said, go ahead, start going at it. And they would have a good time with each other. They would, it was uh, almost a, it was a whole generation trying to get even with their fathers, you know. <laughs> uh, and so they were enjoying it. And I said, there was something maybe about the fact that it was film and this is video today. You know, the film was harder to do. It was more expensive to do. And it, it just it it was just a different kind of uh, thing with it. When video came in, it became very cheap to do and very easy to do. And anybody who went out and bought a camcorder could do porn, you know. And it just changed the whole nature of the business. I was responsible for that, by the way, because I turned out the first porn thing ever on videotape. So yeah. hey, now now you can use Facebook. Or, <laughs> or, you know, live view or whatever. Every, it is. Listen, everybody who owns a a iPhone now, the first right, thing yes. they shoot is probably their girlfriend blowing them. You know, I mean, it's it's you know, I often said the, the when when video cameras came out, cheap video cameras came out, I said the first thing anybody ever shoots when they get a a video camera is their cat. Okay, and the second thing they videotape is their wife blowing them. You know, I didn't have a cat. Huh? You didn't <laughs> have a cat. cat. So you went straight to the blowing. Exactly. Went straight to the blowjob. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, because prior to the, 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 uh, the availability of home video, you could there were things about yourself you could never see. Like you never saw yourself much except in still photographs, but you never saw yourself moving. And so that would be a natural thing that people would be curious about. You know. And at this weight, I don't even see my toes. No. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, uh, but uh, anyway, um, um, let's uh, let's uh, let's talk about a few of the things that are happening out there. I'm feeling tired again tonight. I'm. Yeah. I mean, so, yes, Jeff. I don't know much about it, but I keep hearing about in Cuba a bunch of uh, Americans. Have had all kinds of problems based upon vibrations that went oh, into their oh, oh, head. Oh, that was you're talking about the United States Embassy. Yeah, right? these diplomats uh, got sick, but they cannot find the source. And even though they can't find the source, they're saying they think Cuba knows, but they're not divulging it. Well, they're trying to imply that Cuba did it, and uh, they said the Russians did it, huh? They try to say the Russians did it uh, as well. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Who said the Russians did it? Uh, news. Uh, you know, it's what news? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever CBS, uh, CBSN. That's what I usually watch. There's no reliable news left now that Breitbart left Breitbart or uh, yeah. uh, what's his name left Breitbart. Breitbart died. <laughs> Annan. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, they don't know what caused it. They have no idea, but Trump likes to say it's the Cuban government's trying to, you know. It could be that there's just some kind of um, signal or something in the area that is just causing some kind of havoc with people's brains. It's always possible. I you mean, know, I, uh, I, I worked in radio where if you... I know people that worked out at a studio. You Sometimes the studios were right where the transmitters were. Mm -hmm, and... Mm -hmm. uh, they would start picking up the station on their fillings and their teeth. You know, Mike so, so probably, radio waves uh, can do a lot of shit. Mike would probably know about that. He was a ham operator. And uh, yeah. something, what is it called, a heterodyne? or uh, oh, some, RF. Yeah, no, no, no. But the, when you hear the signal uh, somewhere where it's not supposed to be. A heterodyne is a, is a component of a radio. Uh, RF is the, uh, it's the uh, what you can get. Like yeah. so, uh, sometimes if you touch a uh, piece of coax with a connector and key up a radio, you get an RF burn. Mm. Now, well, those things are nasty. No, this is actually the signal. The signal, okay, like signals, okay, if you go up to a tower 
Yeah. Even with the, I've been up to the towers where they have microwave towers. Yeah. And you can actually feel the microwave going through you. Yeah. And they say, quote unquote, well, we'll turn it down. As soon as we call them, they just lower the uh, signal down. Mm -hmm. If not, we couldn't okay. stay up there. It, it was stuff like uh, uh, going so through somebody else's TV when you when you keyed your mic. Yeah, yeah it's RF. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But yes, anyway, I, run, I opened up people's from mics. Right. Anyway, Jeff, that's kind of an old story. I, it's been around for a while, and I don't know what the resolution of it was. There Finally, was I just heard about it again. Where did Which, you hear? Where did you hear about it? Did they make the news again? Yeah. It was on uh, some radio. I was yeah. listening to uh, when I was in the car. Yeah, uh, in Florida, but um, I, you know, they said that that Cuba, well, they they didn't do it. They, they're saying guarantee that we had nothing to do with it. Well, you know, the, you know, okay, the Cuban government had, has has no reason to do anything like that because they're trying to normalize relationships with the United States. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think that they had anything to do with it. I don't think they would do anything to screw up their relationship with the United States. <clears throat> you remember the uh, the U.S. Embassy in, uh, in Russia? Uh, when, uh, it was built by Russians, and yeah. there were so many bugs in that, a building that they couldn't move into the building because not and not bug well, insects. Well, well the same talking. the same thing is true about um, no the same thing is true about um, uh, uh, hotels. Just ask Trump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's fake, but huh? uh, and the president says so. <laughs> oh yeah, he says so. He says yeah. so. Uh, uh, come on, Phil. Do you really believe everything he says? Do you really <laughs> believe it? What? Come on, hey, you, know, you can't. You know, Trump, it, Trump Tower caught on fire too. On yeah, uh, five hundred feet tall uh, off the roof. That you know that building's five hundred feet tall. What, what building? Trump Tower. Yeah, and what happened? It was a fire in the top floor, I think. Oh, the air conditioner or where the air conditioning uh, started. Units are. Yeah, yeah, that's probably why it happened. Uh, too bad it didn't burn to the fucking ground. <laughs> it's, it, how do you fight a fire 500 feet up? Well, they do. I mean, we, we live in New York City. They know how to fight fires at, 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 in skyscrapers. I mean, yeah. we don't have a ladder that goes up the side of them, but they have other ways of getting up there. I don't know. Yeah, I would imagine they'd have to use a helicopter. We have more problems in this town with cranes falling. Yeah. Mm. You know, I mean, and they're, what happens is, you know how the... the, the Sometimes you see a crane is at the very top of this tall, huge building, and you yeah. wonder how they ever got it up there. You know how they get it up there? No. Yep, piece by piece. Huh? Piece by no. piece in the, center of, in the center of the building, and they go up and up and up, and every time they go to another floor, they add another section and another section and another section, and then they're at the very top, and there's the crane, and do you know what they do with it once they uh, once they're finished? They get Comes rid of the crane. Pitch. They get rid of the crane on the top, and they turn it into an elevator shaft. Really? That was a guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, a friend of mine who works in the crane business told me when they put those things together, those uh, tall, uh, tall cranes, mm -hmm. he says it's piece by piece. Yes. When they take it down, it's piece by piece. Each piece goes down, comes down. Yeah, but I heard that, that rather than do that, what they do is they make it part of the structure of the building. That would make well, sense. That would make more sense than tearing it down. You see these crazy photographers that get up on top of these skyscrapers and then take selfies of themselves hanging off the edge of the skyscraper and looking down, uh, you know, 100 floors or whatever. Yeah, they should die. Yeah, they should a few die. of them have. They should die. Yeah. yeah. One guy, uh, he was uh, pretty athletic, and he was hanging off the edge of the skyscraper with his hand yeah. and taking uh, the picture, and he lost balance and fell. Uh, and I don't remember how many stories, but it was at least seventy or eighty. Yeah, I'm going to make my oh. I'm going to make my picture bigger here, because uh, nobody else is calling tonight. What is this? We have a low low viewership, and and nobody's calling. Is I, this some sort of holiday? No. I don't think so. No, I have no idea what it is, but fuck you. Now, see, now I'm big. 
okay? Oops, there was an, uh, whenever I hear that clunk, it usually means there's some headline coming through. Yeah. Washington Post, uh, Judge Temporary Blocks Trump's Plan to Rescind Immigration Protections for Dreamers. Uh, just this week, you know, the, the, uh, based on what the courts have been doing, they'll, they'll overrule that. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that, you know. Uh, but Mr. Cr Mr. Mr. Cruel will do anything that it can he can do to make people feel miserable. That, that was established in 2001 or 2002 on the Salvadoran uh, refugees after the earthquake. And I think if you're going to let people come here because of the uh, issues they were having after the earthquake, mm -hmm. it's been long enough. You know, yeah. it's been 15, 16 but let years. Me, let, me, let me say this about that, Phil. When you yeah. come here, you don't just come here and just starve and not do anything and not seek employment, not seek a life, because you don't know how long you're going to be here and you have right. to support yourself, okay? And we, they, so many of them become productive citizens in, in the... In, 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 well, let me finish. Let me finish. All right. They become, uh, you know... Uh, productive citizens of this country, tax-paying citizens, and um, we won't call them citizens, but inhabitants. Uh, and uh, then all of a sudden, after 15 years, where they're very used to living here and they have their life here and they've, they've even had families here and so on, you're telling them to go back. Well, now I understand, yes, legally, they, they have every right to tell you to go back because you came here in a tragedy, the tragedy has subsided, and you can go back to your part of the country, and it's probably been rebuilt and everything else. But also, it's the country you don't know anymore. You, you've made a life for yourself here. And I think, you know, I mean, what's the harm in them staying here? They've been here for 15 years. Are they suddenly going to be terrorists or something? No. I, I don't think that's it. I think that, you know, you came in for one reason, and now it's time to go. Well, you, but I, isn't that a bit don't, isn't that a bit cruel? No. Don't they have, don't they have the right? Don't they have the right? What? They have fifteen years of an American lifestyle, and you know they weren't American citizens to begin with. I think that what they did, letting them come over here, was uh, was generous, and you know deals the deal. It, of course, it was generous, and and I think that, but because they, it's then we should have sent them back earlier. But we waited fifteen years, and fifteen years is a long time. Yes, it is. Well, yes, don't, my, they, don't my, they have the right though? If they stay here for fifteen years, if they want to become American citizens, do they have the right to do it? Yes. Well, did they? Some did. Yes. Well, those the ones that did are still here. The ones that didn't are uh, saying, uh, uh, "Hola." <laughs> you know. Well, I you know, mean, there are two hundred thousand. Uh, there are two hundred thousand of them. They're throwing out of the country. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I, and, you know, and hey, it's time that they cleaned up uh, the immigration stuff, and 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 if you know, if you were to come to another country as a uh, as a refugee that is being given temporary uh, status, uh, do you think they're going to let you stay? Probably. Yes, yes. Well, probably. Yeah. You don't know what in country. Germany, what country would. in Germany they but would? Germany, in, in, oh, yeah, Merkel in, would. In, let in, us, in, oh, in Ber Britain they would. In France they would. Yes, they're known for that. So yeah, that was. Well, so in Canada, they don't. Well, that's Canada. You know yeah. why don't we build a wall up there for Christ's sake? They already yeah. have one. And and we paid for it. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> there is no wall up there. <clears throat> Looks like a wall. Yeah, what? Uh, yeah, I saw. Me I thought Mexico was going to pay for this wall. What are we arguing about? How how we're going to come up with the money? Well, they will now. Take it out of Trump's uh, fund. You know what Trump is going to do? He's going to say, "Well, look, you know, dreamers, you want to stay here? It's twenty five thousand dollars a piece goes to the wall." You know. No, uh, Trump, you donate the money. There you go. There's your tax right off. I I think that when you the Mexicans it, to you pay know, for it. Uh, define the dreamers, okay? Because by pure definition, trying to get them to leave is cruel. But go ahead, define the dreamers. Define them. They're uh, people through no circumstances of their own, as as youths. Mm -hmm. uh, their parents broke the law, brought them into this country, and uh, and they're and they're here. Or maybe they didn't break the law. Maybe they uh, they did immigrate here, 
and uh, their immigration has run out. And they, after their immigration ran out, they just continued to stay here. But well, well, well forget. You, you, I know you love to use that word illegal, but the kid did nothing illegal. Okay. No, but and uh, then the kid, so the kid, the kid comes here probably as a baby. All right. He grows up here. He speaks. He doesn't even speak his native language. He only speaks English. And now you're expecting him to go back to a country he doesn't even know <clears throat> that, that in the law. In the law, there's something called the fruit of the contaminated no, tree. No, that's a whole different deal. That but, has, that what has to, no. It, that has it, no. That it, that has to. That, that has to do with evidence. It's the fruit of it's, it's the uh, the uh, fruit of the uh, this uh, something uh, of the poisonous fruit. I forget the first. Yeah, word. yeah, uh, yeah. I, and it has nothing to do not has nothing to do with what we're talking well, about. It has to do with crime, criminal activity. Committed. The parents. Of no, the, no, but it is not the, the it, it is not the poisonous fruit. I'm sorry, Phil. It's not the same fucking thing. So, uh, you know, don't uh, that deals with uh, uh, crimes in which people are, are stealing something or doing something. I can't remember how it's exactly used. Uh, let me I'll look it up here. Okay, now, what happens if you receive stolen property and then they find out that that stolen property belongs to Jeff? And Jeff wants to claim it. That person who received or bought that stolen property has no right to it. It's the fruit of the thing. Well, it's the same thing with these kids. They're, they were, uh, you know, they may have, they received what they thought was, uh, you know, life in the, in the United States, but it's not theirs to have. You know, I, and I'm not saying it's not mean. I'm not saying I wouldn't wish that these people be given... Uh, the right to stay here. I'm just looking at it and saying, "Hey, this is this is the reality." Uh, it, it, I don't care if it's a reality, Phil. Isn't there a certain kind of uh, human compassion that we should have for people, and especially these kids who, through no work of their own, no no deception of their own or anything, were grew up here in the United States? Because their parents came here, and now they're they're maybe 15, 20 years old, 20, some of them 25, and they don't even speak the language of the country that they I came from. No they've never them. been to the country they've came come from. Uh, all their friends, all their associates, their jobs, everything are here. What there was kind of what kind of low life wants to kick those people out of the no, country? No one, except the Democrats, and I'll tell you why. Uh -huh. There was a one-hour meeting. Oh, hold on, hold on, Mike. There was a one-hour meeting at the White House today, and it was televised. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the uh, Trump said that uh, if you want DACA to uh, to go through and for these kids to do it, I got to have my wall and uh, and other border security uh, things. So if the Democrats would allow Trump to get his wall, those DACA but, kids. But what if, what if they're opposed to the wall? They are opposed it, to the, the wall. wall has nothing. It, the oh, wall should have. Why the hell do we need that damn wall? Trump says we need it. Uh, oh, it, bullshit. Yeah, Trump it's says he needs it. It's wall. the only thing he knows. I'm reading this book, by the way. The, 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 the Fire and Fury. Fire and Fury. Got it on my, fake, got it on my Kindle. I've been reading yes. it. Uh, they say the only thing he knows is how to build something. That's all he knows. He knows nothing else. He has no other... Uh, a thing that he he can sit down and talk about. All he knows That's is that. Well, that now, so the so, deal with the wall. He wants the wall. They want DACA. If the if they no 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 no. That's but no, there's, no, 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 no. there's no deal there, Phil. There's That's no the deal, deal there. Come on. It's a bunch of bull. We talk about DACA, then we'll talk about your wall. But if we don't want to build your wall, that has that should not affect people's lives. He's negotiator. He says we'll talk about well, the Well, uh, fuck you in negotiating. This is the not hell with their damn wall. Uh, to begin, oh, also the book uh, also shows where he was a terrible negotiator. This is a terrible <laughs> negotiator. It was one of his big faults. What did he do in the White House? Uh, they they don't have uh, uh, the uh, the toilet paper is single uh, single stack, not double. You know what 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 did he negotiate? So what did he negotiate so terribly? What examples did he give? Most of his business deals were terribly terribly. Uh, he do you know he can't even add a balance sheet 
He can't read a balance yeah. sheet. He doesn't know how to read a balance sheet. This is a businessman. Hire people. Phil, to read do you know how to read a balance sheet? Not really. No. Oh well, then you're like Trump. <laughs> yeah. Remind me to uh, let me, I know he, he has Trump he is, is, if you, uh, but I Remind me to come to over show and me ratios. I need somebody to, uh, you know, to, to sit down and point. This stuff is Mister Big Business. He should know how to read a balance sheet or know what goes into a balance sheet. He well, supposedly it's, it's, it's he supposedly knows nothing. There's the, the classic story where somebody felt that, that he should be read the United States Constitution so he knew what was in it. And by the time he got, they got to the Third Amendment, he was going... Well, pull his hair out. Go, wee! You know, he probably didn't like the First Amendment. He, he liked the Second and the Third. Well, I was a little bored by then. You know. I mean, come on. You've got, you've got a perfect moron as president. This is, you know... It's 25th Amendment time, I'm telling you. Well, that's what they're trying to create. The trouble and, is with uh, 25th Amendment, everybody talks about it, but the fact is it, to implement it takes so much that uh, it, by the time he did it, he'd no longer be president, and Oprah would be president. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine if uh, Oprah uh, had to expose all of her business dealings and to... Re, uh, not recuse, but to uh, put all her stuff in a blind trust, and you know she's a very wealthy uh, no, she woman. She would in her be. Own right. I'm sure she would be There's happy to do that. I'm sure she would be happy to do that. But you know, the thing is, you remember how uh, politicians used to go around and talk about putting a chicken in every pot. Well, she's talking about you get a car and you get a car and you get a yeah. car. Yeah. But you get a Buick. Yeah, but uh, it's you good know, for GM. <laughs> I'll tell you something. Um, if she ran against Trump, I think she'd win. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And and not that I say that that's a good idea. I think that her being president is as bad an idea as Donald Trump being president for exactly the same reason. Yeah. Okay. See, yeah, she might be a better uh, she business ran a corporation too, uh, a billion dollar corporation, oh, multi multi billion. She's worth more than Trump. Uh, I thought she was worth one billion personally. No, they say that Trump is not a billionaire. Never was a billionaire. Okay. Uh, if you, I've read in Forbes, they had all of his properties and how much mortgage was, and he has what? about three billion in equity. Wow, what is that you're doing, uh, Jeff? It makes all that yeah. noise. This thing keeps falling off, so I'm moving it around. Oh, okay. I apologize. Uh, uh, no, but in the book it says that, that in fact, uh, billionaires who he knew said, this guy is not a billionaire, never yeah. was a billionaire. Uh, he, he, you know, he takes his properties and he says, that's worth so much and that's worth so much, but that's not personal wealth. Well, okay. yeah. Hey, you know, I, I understand that. I mean... <laughs> Uh, you know, I have a business that does uh, over a million dollars a year, let's say, and uh, I don't take anywhere near that as a salary. Uh, you know, and I guess he's just counting the business because it's personally held like mine is. Uh, it's personally held. And uh, he says that's his money. It's so more it, likely, it's, isn't uh, Trump's more like a, um, a land investor? Well, he he's a landlord, you know, and there have been times in my life when I was a landlord and it was pretty damn nice, except when they called you when something was well, broken. But, but, well, you say he's a landlord, but the fact is that most of those properties that have his name on them, he doesn't even own. Well, those are those properties. He, what about you know, he, 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 licenses, he licenses out the name as a product. I understand. That's one of his products, but what about that's all his the only product. That's, that's his only product? That's his only product. No, no, he's got thousands of units that he inherited from his father in Brooklyn. Remember, you know, his father was a, a real estate guy. If you owned that many units in, in Brooklyn back then, you bought them for eight cents. Does on he a, still know, owe those, or did he get rid of them at some point? I don't know. But, uh, I, you know. More likely, he probably got rid of them. Uh, I'll look, you know. Uh, oh, I thought he told everybody all about his financial stuff, right? No, not exactly. No, he didn't tell us? No. Oh. I, oh, I it is not, he, he, Jeff, am I correct? He didn't tell nothing about his taxes either. That's right. 
We don't know anything about him. No. The one who knows his business is, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Vegas, uh, Steve. Um, Steve Wynn? Yeah. What about him? He knows what the hell, what he's doing in business-wise. Better than Trump does. Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, we do know that, that Trump is a big liar on a daily basis. Yeah. So, Who the, it's kind that? of hard to understand. It was a journalist that interviewed Steve Wynn, and, uh, a famous journalist, and she knocked over a painting worth, uh, was it 300000 or $3 million or something in his, in his, in his office? Uh, and it was like, uh, it wasn't Katie Couric, but it was like somebody might have been. Hmm. Steve Wynn. Um, I think Steve Wynn once said uh, Trump, he said that Trump is, uh, is that what you call a successful business person, period? Is it not a what? <laughs> not a very good uh, business person. No. Um, so it seems as though from this headline, uh, Donald Trump abandoned his father's middle-class housing empire for a luxury building. Uh, hmm. uh, the guy... Uh, started buying buildings uh, when he was in 1926. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Trump and son officially headed it uh, until he was 21. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. So um, uh, Trump and Ruffin still own 398 condos in the building worth uh, 169 million. So uh, I guess, you know, they, 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 I don't think we're going to have to worry about getting this guy a meal. Here's a great story from the book. Trump's understanding of his own essential nature was even more precise. Once coming back on his plane with a billionaire friend who had, bought, uh, who had brought along a foreign model, Trump, trying to move in on his friend's date, urged a stop in Atlantic City. He would provide a tour of his casino. His friend assured the model that there was nothing to recommend Atlantic City. It was a place overrun by white trash. <laughs> and she said, what is this white trash, asked the model. They're people just like me, said Trump, only they're poor. <laughs> <laughs> Good sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, there, there, there are people that, uh, uh, it, oh, here, here it is. Um, uh, where is it? Uh, um, uh, almost all the professionals were now set to join him, blah, 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 blah. Everything with him was off the cuff. Whatever he knew, he seemed to have learned the hour before. And he was mostly half-baked. But each member of the new Trump team was convincing him or herself otherwise because, they didn't, uh, because what they did know was the man had been elected president. He offered something, obviously. Indeed, while everybody in his rich guy social circle knew about the wide-ranging ignorance, uh, 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 Trump, the full of... Uh, wait a minute. Uh, his extreme self-satisfaction rubbed off. Life was sunny. Trump was an optimist, at least about himself. He was charming and full of flattery. He focused on you. He was funny, self-deprecating even, and incredibly energetic. Let's do it. Whatever it is, let's do it. He wasn't a tough guy, and he wasn't a big, warm-hearted monkey, said Ban he, he was a big, warm-hearted monkey, said Bantam, with a rather faint praise. PayPal co-founder and Facebook member Peter Thiel, recently, really, the only significant Silicon Valley voice to uh, support Trump, was warned by another billionaire at the time, that Trump's friend, that Trump would, in an explosion of flattery, offer Thiel his undying friendship. Everybody says you're great and you're going to have an amazing working relationship, anything you want. Call me and it's done, he says. Thiel was advised not to take Trump's offer too seriously <laughs> because that's, I guess, the way he was. Uh, Bree's calling from... Uh, uh, Bloomberg estimates Dubai. his fortune at $3 billion. Mm -hmm. Forbes puts it at 4 and, a half, and Trump at 10 Yeah, well... Uh, that's uh, that's the deal. Anyway, it, it's a fun book to read. I got to tell you that right now. 
Uh, yeah. You know. Uh, uh, now, we had another situation today where Bannon was let go by Breitbart. I thought he owned Breitbart. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Bree, uh, how you doing? Yes, good, Alex. How are you? Fine. No, Bright. Hey, Alex, yeah. That, that white trash uh, segment, that's what I called it. That, that was one that stood out to me as well, and I, I got a good laugh out of it. Yeah. You know, this book is chock full of chuckles. Uh, it, it, and the other thing, it's funny, it reads like kind of a historical representation, you know, like a historiography. And yet it's only pretty much the past year. What this guy did, he basically took the past year, what everybody knows, we all know these individual things. When Sean Spicer came out and yelled at the press, we all remember those. He, what he has done is eloquently you know, put it to prose. And so you can read in a, in a fun and uh, lively way. Oh, and, and in terms of poorly written, no way. It, no, it's, it's, very, it's, well. very, it's very entertainingly written. Yes, and it's erudite. I mean, I have to look up a word every other, you know, every other page. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I have a Ph.D. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> the, uh, I think it's uh, an entertaining book. You're right. I mean, they're trying, and, to, they're trying to discredit him. And he said, look, he said, that I have no opinion in this book. He said, what I did, and, and, and I, I believe him, it looks like it. He says, no, I, I was a fly on the wall watching these people. And then I'm reporting what these what these people were saying and what what was going on in the rooms and and what they would occasionally say to me. Uh, he said I, that what I'm reporting is how people around him were reacting to him. What's his reason for being there? You well, know, he, uh, Alex, I think he is like Michael Moore. He's a point of view storyteller. I mean, he definitely has a point no, of view. No, he and a he theme. he claims he didn't have a point of view when he did it. Oh. He, he, but when you read it, he does. Well, I'm no, a, well, no. You you could say he has a point of view, but maybe that's just the view. You know, I mean, maybe he's just an accurate reporter who's reporting what he saw. No, well, I, I can give you several examples of where it's not. Um, you know, what I, I mainly I do a lot of what I do is I do content analysis of media, w which means that I look for patterns and themes yeah. within works. Yeah, I do it. Yeah, I, I've done it for many, many years. So for me, the you know, all media is a manipulation, it's a construction, and it, you just have to know where to look. It's like looking at a building, or you know, or looking at a car. Diff mechanics would tell you would know certain things about it versus just your average layperson or an architect would know about a building. Well, I know about the way that media is created and presented. Yeah, and I'm, yeah, I'm telling you that yeah, you know, that's the way it is. He is Michael Moore of books. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't, but so far, I wouldn't put him in that class. Michael Moore's a little more of a muckraker. This guy didn't seem to be muckraking particularly. He seemed, uh, my wife described it more as like reading uh, the Daily News or the New York Post, you know, and their yes. way of yeah. interpreting yeah. stuff. Uh, it's more like, he said, she said, it's kind of more like a gossip novel than it is anything yeah. else. Um, and, uh, but for whatever reason, let's say he's lying about 90% of it. The 10% that's true is still going to be fucking scary, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know, it, it, um, I don't know that it's lying, but I would call it jazembling. What's interesting. What's interesting to me is that uh, the people you're saying, how did he get the people to talk to him? It's like they wanted to, you know? It's like nobody who is there to protect Trump, you know. According to the yeah. people at the White House, they're saying they didn't talk to him. Well, that, that's bullshit. I mean, this guy even has recordings. <laughs> okay. Well, they they didn't know they didn't know the game. They didn't know that talking to him was a, was going to come back and bite them. And and, and I got to tell you something. Even if they did, Trump doesn't really care. He he is. It's I was the analogy I have is it's kind of like saying. You know, Khaleesi on Game of Thrones is it's a, it's a dumb move for her to walk into fire. Well, no, she was born of fire, so she it's fine for her. So Trump and media, like you can have anybody from the media around him. It's not going to hurt him. It's just going to help him. He was born of the media. He was born of the chaos. You know, there was a book many years ago. Uh, who's the guy? Howard Kurtz wrote about Trump. 
Mm-hmm. And it, it tells you everything you need to know. And I'm surprised nobody really has brought that up. Uh, but it was like media circuses or something. And uh, it, it, this tr- for Trump, this look at the book, even some of the pages where he describes the way that Trump operates. It's exactly how he's operating against him. It's like Michael Wolf custom made this for Trump. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Trump encouraged it and, and knew what was happening at the time and thought, this is just going to be great because it's going to be more, you know, more attention to me. It, I mean, this book, I guarantee you that Donald Trump reads it because this book is custom made for him and he I loves this. Re- well, you're, you're but, right. He would probably read it out of his own ego. He'll get it on tape. you know um but he loves this book it's custom made for him and it and and it elicits the exact reaction that the author knew it's like he studied it and he's he's just playing the same exact game right back at trump he even said he said in a couple interviews he's like the least credible man on earth you know that's exactly what Trump does, you know, if you see it, and, and his uh, Stephen Miller did this on CNN, the, it's grotesque, it's grotesque, blah, blah, blah. You use basic vocabulary. You repeat it over and over, and it has to be black and white. I had a friend of mine who was back in the States over Christmas and said, basically, everybody is, you're either really for Trump, you love him, and he's the greatest thing on earth, or you hate him, and, and he's terrible. And she said, it's just black and white everywhere. Like, there's no, there's very little middle ground. It's like, either you believe or you don't. You know, I think it's an American revolution. I think we didn't have any other way to change the system. And people, you know, some people saw Trump as the way to change the system. And some people saw him as the apprentice guy. And some people saw him as the reality TV guy. And some of them thought of him as the anti-Hillary. And he, it was just a perfect storm for what is essentially a revolution. That, you know, because we can't go on the streets. Nobody wants to get shot. Nobody wants to get tear gassed. Most people are too lazy. They don't really understand. This was their way of pulling the, the pulling that uh, voting tab and and issuing forth a revolution, essentially. Um, uh, yes. Uh, I, uh, but I, and I think, look, let, let's talk about what went on this weekend. Uh, Oprah goes on the Golden Globes, which I like to refer to as the phony fuck awards. Because there's, you know, it's like 72 out of work uh, yeah. writers in Hollywood who vote on these things. It's not like J- a James whole... Franco, huh? Yeah, he James got his Franco's award. Franco's wishing he huge... didn't go. You know, uh, James Franco. You know, they alluded to him and some accusations during the Golden Globes. He then he receives his award, and an hour or so later, I guess there were some Wearing tweets. The pen. Would you like? Uh, would you like the biggest gaff of all? What's that? What? Kirk, Kirk Douglas was there. Oh, right. Yes. And, yeah, they, and they all stood up oh, and cheered oh. him. Do you realize oh, that the main accusation against Kirk Douglas is that he raped Natalie yes. Wood? Yeah. yeah. You know, I, all of this is I, accusation. I, well, wait a minute. I hold on. Hold on a second. Yeah. Phil, you're going off on a wrong tangent yeah. here. What I'm saying is there has been the accusation over the years about him and about his general demeanor with women who wanted to curry favor with him and get work That's from right. him. Well, well, Alex, Alex and yet the they stood up there in their little, you know, what, yes. what's the newest term? Uh, time's up. Little up, pin. Yeah. Yeah, time's pin. up. Yeah, applauding Alex, this guy who is of Alex, questionable character where that's concerned. Yeah, but, you know. Alex, I, gotta, I have oh, a meeting oh. in 12 minutes i got to run to. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wanted to get this in. What was the name? And get us back to Oprah Winfrey. But what was the name of the award that she won? And what was that guy known for? The Cecil, Cecil B. Cecil B. DeMille. DeMille Award, and, in which he was known for a, the casting know. couch. Yep. Uh, Oprah Winfrey for president, yeah. and Rock Dwayne Rock Johnson for vice president. Yeah. Yeah. It, what what All what's right. happening there? What what's happening there was a, was a, a huge hypocrisy at that moment. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, here, here's what I feel about Oprah. Uh, I've never been the biggest Oprah fan in the world, but barring that, okay, uh, I think voting for Oprah Winfrey is the same kind of mistake you made with Donald Trump. Okay. Michael Douglas that has been accused of, uh, well, he has two runs in the family. Yeah. (laughs) 
Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a, uh, uh, another uh, politician, a Republican, that killed himself today uh, over uh, being accused. Uh, that's well, one way to uh, well, it's uh, or as a lot of us feel a beginning. Yeah, and uh, uh, then all now there's two more um, uh, people that have come out against uh, Russell uh, Russell Simmons. Yeah, well, so uh, we're, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Oprah. We're talking about the Academy Awards, and you take us off into this ditch. If I started talking about Stalin, we'd be off in a ditch. But I'm talking about uh, no, you no, uh, no. We're talking about we're talking about the uh, Oprah and this newfound thing that everybody has that she's going to be the candidate for the Democrats in uh, in uh, in uh, when when's now, the next election? What's what uh, caught about that? Is Trump said he wanted Oprah Winfrey as his vice president in 1999 on a CNN interview, and uh, has Trump responded yet? Because as soon as they said Mark Cuban was going to run, he responded right away. Has he responded against Oprah? Uh, it, uh, he said he doesn't. Yes, he was asked about it. He said he didn't think she could win against him, but he likes Oprah. That he, you know, she's been a friend over the years, and he likes Oprah, but he doesn't think that okay. she would win. Uh, uh, who's the comedian that uh, 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 that um, had a successful show that used to? Sleep in a van when she was in San Francisco. Roseanne, Roseanne Barr. Roseanne. Uh, I guess she's going to have a new show, and that new well, show it, is going to be pro-Trump. No, the show oh. is they're re, they're redoing Roseanne. <laughs> right, and she says well, that she's she, going to be a she Trump ran before on the show. She has run for president. She ran on the Green Party ticket. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, no. All right. I got a meeting at uh, ten. Uh, okay. Uh, in ten minutes, so I got to run. Thanks, Thanks for calling. Bye bye. Yep. Bye bye. Uh, no, but it, it's uh, 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 the show is Roseanne. They're doing Roseanne, and maybe they're making the character a, a Trump right. supporter because they're they're trailer trash. That's know? right. Yeah. You know, so we don't know that that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't. I never heard that about this new show. But you know, we'll see how it's portrayed. Huh? We'll see how it's portrayed. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, she said. Uh, I guess she actually likes Trump. Uh, according to the article I was reading, uh, and said that uh, her character would have been a Trump supporter, so that's how they're writing it in the show. Well, they, he, she may be right about that. Yeah. You know. But I think that the I, the notion of Oprah as a candidate is as bad a notion as the notion of Trump as a candidate. And I think... America would make the same mistake again. I, th you know, I think I think she would be marginally better, but I think she would be just as inexperienced and just uh, as much out of her element. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, if 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 she does run and she does win, I think this concept that we're going to take all our people from uh, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze here any second. Hold on. <laughs> Yeah. Bless you. Uh, Bless you. Uh, the, that the, um, uh, the the notion that she she could be a, a great president is, you know, come on. I mean, you know, she gave an inspirational speech the other day, <clears throat> and she gave a, a it, she gave a speech in which she was pandering to the crowd she was playing for. Uh, I love you know, I think she would get the women's vote. I think a lot of guys would be pussy whipped into voting for her. And uh, I, I think her chances would be very good, especially against the oafishness of, uh, of uh, Donald Trump. But it's still he's the same running. mistake. Okay. He's and, not running again. If he says that he's not going to run, then what does he become? A lame duck. As soon as he says that he's not going to run in 2020, you can label him a, a lame dog. Well, he's, so not, he's not going to announce that this early anyway, but he doesn't no, have to that, sit around so saying he when said, he doesn't have to sit around and constantly go when I run in blah, blah, right. blah. Right now he can raise money. He's raising money, which will go uh, to uh, wh whatever candidates uh, he, he wants to support. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, but, you know, it's, it's very simple. The man probably isn't going to run in 2020, but he can't say that. Because as soon as he does, well, it's it doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's too yeah. early. I, it's too early for Oprah. 
you know. But of course, in a way, she's got about a year, and then she's got to start campaigning, and that's the way things go now. Um, I, I think, I think she may make an attempt at it. I think what it will do is it then throws her into a different arena, and then. We'll have to see how much people love her after a while because she's going to start getting assailed. She's going to have to start fighting back to keep the. She may not want to do that, uh, and yeah. the reason being is it will upset her uh, empire. The other night, yeah, well, that that too. But she's so rich, she could say, "Fuck the empire! I got my money." And uh, yeah, but there's know. a lot of people that depend on their livelihood because of her empire. Not a lot of them. Not a no. lot. Not a lot. No, it's not. Well, a don't big... you have to rate start getting your funding together, the money together to start your. Campaign? I would say probably she'll fund it herself. You think Trump, so? Trump will write her a check. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. About probably. What do you think, Jeff? You've been quiet about this. What do you think about Oprah? I don't think she wants that job. Uh, I don't think she. I think your idea that uh, she would be. Maybe not the same person as Trump has, but I think she'll have a lot of the same problems. Well, I said that we'd be making the American public would be making the same mistake again. Yeah, I I, I agree with you on that. I thought about that uh, the other day the when, I, when I heard her. I said she's not the right person. Yeah, the Republicans are going to do to the next Democratic leader what the Democrats have been doing to Trump. Uh, it's only going to get worse, you know. Well, they want to make it illegal for these guys to attack. There, the, you know, there are those though that are better at not being thin-skinned about it. I mean, there were books about Obama that assailed him. Uh, there were people who said horrible things about Obama, and he never dignified it with a reply. All he did with this book was make this guy a huge fucking fortune, because if he didn't say anything about the book. It would have just been another book coming out about Trump. No, but they, the people were have been looking for justification in their in their uh, hatred That's of Trump. That's fine, but if he didn't mention it, if he didn't say word one about it, but you, he, he forget it, he can't keep his mouth shut. I mean, even the guy himself said, "I want. I really should send Donald Trump a check because I'm going to make a lot of money off of this book, and it's because he couldn't keep his mouth shut." Uh, well, the Democrats will probably say that Donald Trump owns a piece of the book and he's only manipulating it <laughs> to make money. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, uh, it, uh, but it, it's, it's a good read and you might enjoy it, actually, Phil. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to do what Donald yeah, Trump you know, I just I just can't yeah. believe that my friend, my friend Phil Meyer uh, really backs a dope like this guy because you're not as stupid <laughs> as he is. <laughs> Okay. Well, I I, uh, I I went to the Donald Trump School of uh, Knowledge. I, I learned oh, about. I, I, oh. I learned well, about. Well, how long did that take? An hour and a half. That's right. I, I, I learned okay. about my topics an hour before. Phil <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Myers for president. Oh man! Oh man! Oh boy! Well, anyway, self-deprecating too. You know, that's part of. Uh, that's yeah. uh, one of the courses at the Donald Trump School. Roll, roll the theme. Uh, okay. There you go. People up. Hey, that's about it for tonight. Oh, boy. Yeah, well, you know, we didn't have a lot of people watching, and we didn't have a lot of people calling, but we had a good show. So they'll, maybe they'll catch up with it in the next 24 hours and see what they missed, but it was a good show. We talked about a lot of interesting stuff here. And, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I, just, I just don't want to see us make the same mistake again. You know what I want for our next president? A good, hardcore politician. That's what I would like. <laughs> You know, yeah. from if, New York. if I if I have bad pipes, I call a, a plumber who knows how to fix pipes. OK, just remember uh, that. What do they call it? The deep, uh, the, 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 the deep story or the deep uh, something uh, of uh, these uh, un underground politicians. I don't are, know. Uh, you, you, we couldn't, you got us all going on poisonous fruit earlier. <laughs> the tree of the poisonous fruit. That's the yeah, that's, that's it, the yeah. uh, term. <laughs> Anyway, hey, thank you all for uh, being with us tonight. Thanks to uh, Bree, of course, calling us from uh, Dubai. Jeff, my respects to you tonight. Same to you, Mike. Same to you, Phil. Uh, I think it would be a nice idea if all of you just kind of 
wave goodbye to the folks out there in uh, in uh, Facebook land. And uh, I, I, they're waving in case you're listening in radio land. Thank you. We'll see you again, hopefully, right here tomorrow night. Let me do a few things to turn things off here. Uh, how do I turn off my computer? I tell it I don't love it. No, anyway, that's an old joke. I'm Alex Bennett. Next is uh, The Intersection with Jack and Amy, followed by Connections. All of a sudden, I'm plugged up, but better now than never. Uh, we'll see you again uh, tomorrow night, same time, same station in life. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Bye. Bye.